Hernandez from uh, University of Copenhagen that's going to talk about instrumental variable in sparse and dynamical setting. Thank you very much, Jonas. The stage is yours. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot um, for the organizers to organize this uh, workshop and uh, a special thank you uh, for making it possible to uh, join remotely. Um, so I have mostly watched the uh, videos both live and afterwards uh, via the website and it worked perfectly. So that was uh, very nice and I highly appreciate your efforts there. So this was a really a nice setup. Um, I'm going to talk about um, two um, sort of questions we have uh, recently uh, been wondering about and they are uh, related to instrumental variable approaches as you're going to see. Uh, so I should uh, mention, so here you see uh, some people from the Copenhagen Causality Lab and uh, the work I'm presenting is a joint work uh, with Niklas you can see over here and uh, the second part will be um, joint work with Sebastian, uh, Nikolai and Rike. Okay, so instrumental variables, we have uh, heard a lot about this uh, already during uh, this workshop. Um, so I'm just introducing them again to uh, clarify the notation I'm going to use in, in this talk. So we have a response variable Y. Uh, we have some covariates, let's say x1 and x2, and we have uh, some hidden confounding. And um, we are assuming a linear model here. So um, the uh, continuous case, um, so not uh, binary variables as we're going to see later, but we are going uh, to assume linearity uh, instead. So here y is just beta 1 star x1 plus beta 2 star x2 plus some uh, noise term. And now there are, of course, many ways of talking about these instrumental variable settings. Um, so I, I like to, uh, at least in this talk, think about this uh, identifying um, moment restriction. Uh, so we assume the exclusion restriction. So uh, formally, uh, I have uh, written it down uh, in graphical terms. Uh, if they don't mean anything to you, this doesn't matter. It's not used later on. This is just to be precise. So we, in particular, we are assuming that the instruments, so here I1, I2, are not uh, influencing Y directly uh, or via the hidden variables. And if this is the case, then we have this um, moment equation here on the left that is satisfied by the true causal parameters, beta 1 star, beta 2 star, namely that the covariance of uh, I um, and Y minus beta 1, X1 minus beta 2, X2, uh, vanishes. And why is this? Well, if you uh, plug in the correct causal parameters, then uh, this term here, this y term, uh, what does it reduce to? Well, this is just the uh, term g of h comma epsilon y. So this is just the hidden variable and the noise, and this is uh, uncorrelated with the instrument. Now, what happens intuitively if I'm using sort of a wrong uh, beta one uh, and beta two, for example, if the first component here is zero, well, uh, then this covariance doesn't vanish anymore. Uh, and intuitively, the reason is that I still see an influence from uh, I1 uh, over X1 on, uh, on Y. So these residuals here, uh, they still uh, carry trace some uh, carry some information about the uh, the first component of I1, for example. So this is why the covariance uh, doesn't measure, it uh, doesn't vanish. Now, um, this is the equation that you saw before. And now, of course, the, uh, the question is, well, if you're interested in, the, uh, in uh, trying to estimate the causal effect by using this equation here on the left-hand side, then sort of this one implication is not enough, but we would like to have an if and only if. Uh, and the question is, well, what is the uh, condition there? And this is, of course, very well understood. Uh, so here we have a full rank condition uh, for the uh, covariance matrix between i and x. And here full rank means uh, the rank is really uh, the same as the number of covariates x. So if this is satisfied, then we have that this is really the unique solution of the moment uh, restriction on the left hand side. So this is, of course, very well understood. Now, in particular, this implies that uh, the number of instruments has to be as least, uh, at least as large as the number of uh, covariates, of course, otherwise this 
full rank condition will never be satisfied. And what uh, we are um, looking at in, in this first pass uh, is the question uh, whether if there are more covariates than instruments, um, we can uh, still do something. So by means of this classical approach, the causal function then is not identifiable um, in, in general. But uh, the question is, can we still do something? For example, if we assume that the uh, causal effects, so this is, these are the red uh, arrows here in this, in this picture, if this is sparse. So if you're thinking about, we have a lot of covariates um, and we only have a sparse causal effect, so only some of them uh, um, really matter for the uh, causal explanation of Y. So most of the uh, coefficients of beta star, if you like, are zero. Uh, this is the question I will uh, say at least a couple of us about this later uh, that we didn't start with. It's actually coming out of, a, uh, um, of an application that we looked at, uh, but we stumbled upon this question and uh, we, we couldn't find an answer to this. Uh, so we, we tried to solve it ourselves, but uh, so I would of course be more than happy if uh, uh, someone of you uh, knows a relevant reference there. Um, uh, so in Joris talk, there were some uh, nice references. So maybe I'm also uh, lucky to, to uh, gain, to benefit from the expertise uh, that is certainly there in the room. So uh, again, just to clarify, um, the, the references are in, in the paper. So we are not assuming, uh, which has been done before and looked at that, for example, we have lots of instruments and maybe only some of them are relevant. So there you can also exploit sparsity, but we are really assuming that the causal effect is sparse, so only some of the covariates matter. Okay, and then in principle, we would like to understand a bit. Um, so let's say uh, we are looking at simple systems. So let's say even the whole system is, is linear. Um, so can we somehow understand uh, under, under which conditions we have identifiability of this causal effect? So for example, in a scenario like this, um, do we have identifiability of the causal function, which are uh, just these uh, two linear parameters here for x1 and x2? And now I should explain a bit what graph I'm drawing here. So um, uh, in this talk, I'm making my life a bit easier by drawing simplified graphs. So the instruments, uh, these the components of the instruments, these I just draw with uh, these rectangle uh, nodes here. In particular, there can, of course, be dependencies between them, but uh, they don't matter for the result I'm presenting. So we just leave them away. Um, and similarly, all of these can be confounded. Uh, so I'm just uh, not drawing any confounders here to make uh, the picture uh, a bit less clattered. Um, so this is, a, this is a question in principle we'd like to understand. Uh, and then, of course, you can also look at scenarios like this. Now, you can answer these questions and I'm, I'm trying to uh, explain a bit like uh, how one could approach this, this problem. So what is actually the method one might want to look at in practice? This is the uh, solution space here. Uh, so basically these are all the betas that satisfy this moment condition. And we uh, have said that the, the causal coefficient is, is one of them. Now, in the under-identified case, this is uh, how this often is called, where we don't have enough instruments, then this is a, um, a space that is usually not a, a single point, uh, but this has um, a non-trivial dimension. So this is a linear subspace. Uh, and the question is now, well, uh, one of these elements is the causal coefficient. Uh, can we somehow find uh, out uh, which one it is? And uh, here we are looking at uh, sparsity assumptions. So uh, one hope would be to say that, well, maybe uh, we can look at the uh, beta that solves this, so that is inside this uh, calligraphic B here, with the smallest L0 norm, so with the smallest number of non-zero <laughs> coefficients. And then the question is, well, uh, under which conditions uh, is this equal to beta star? And this is uh, what I would like to ex explain a bit. Uh, I'm not going through the proof, but I'm trying to uh, convey some intuition and then at least some parts of the, the results. Something that uh, will play an important role, I, maybe I, sh I should clarify, this is actually important. So as you can see here, um, the method, of course, doesn't assume uh, any 
uh, a sort of a linear structure of the overall uh, structural causal model, uh, except for that the causal effect uh, should be linear. Uh, and we don't have to know the causal graph or anything, but in the identifiability um, statement there, we are looking at a specific graph uh, and uh, in particular a linear model, which is uh, what we could analyze um, and then uh, formulate the identifiability results uh, in terms of these. But of course, for the method, uh, we, don't, we don't have to uh, make these assumptions. Okay, so now the uh, quantity that is actually important to formulate these results is the following. This is a matrix uh, that we call C, uh, and this um, describes the total causal effect from the instruments uh, to the individual components of the covariates. So more precisely, it's actually the uh, one of the J's, so the CIJ is actually the slightly different from what's written here. This is a bit simplified. So CIG is actually the i-th component of the total causal effect from i to xj. And what is this? So in this uh, scenario here, uh, how can we construct this matrix C? Well, we just have to see how do the effects propagate through the system. And this will be the crucial uh, bit. So somehow we need to have enough heterogeneity coming from the instruments propagating through the system. Uh, so let's see how this is constructed. Um, the first element, for example, is just the influence from uh, the first instrument on X1. Well, this is just a two. Um, but if you're looking, for example, at uh, this minus five here, how is this constructed? This is the, if you like, the causal effect from the second instrument to X2. And here you can see, well, there are actually two directed paths. We get a minus two from this path via X1, and we get a minus three from this direct path. So they add up to minus five. And then here, this last component, this is corresponding to the effects from the instruments on uh, X3. So this one doesn't have any effect on X3. And the second instrument has the effect one. Now, this is actually a, a crucial um, object to look at. And if you're familiar with linear structural causal models, then uh, this is uh, not a surprise. They, uh, these things appear if you're uh, solving the uh, linear structural causal models um, uh, and write them in terms of noise, noise variables. Okay, so here are the conditions. Uh, one of the conditions is uh, small on purpose. You don't have to, to read it. Um, the first one is uh, capital. So what does it say? It says that uh, the rank of a certain part of the matrix, so this is the this is corresponding to the columns that are the parents of Y. So these are, um, uh, these are the X's that we would like to recover. Uh, this has to be large enough. And this is not uh, surprising that this uh, condition appears here because we need to have, uh, of course, at least uh, as much heterogeneity um, or sufficient heterogeneity in the parents itself. So this is basically what it's saying. The second condition uh, I don't read out because I, I think, at least for me, it would be a bit too technical to understand in a talk. And um, what this is basically saying is that um, there shouldn't be any uh, sort of weird uh, um, we had matches of coefficients. This is a bit like uh, faithfulness saying uh, you sh should not have direct uh, exact cancellation of, of directed paths. And here uh, there are certain coefficients that should not match up uh, exactly. And this is usually satisfied if you choose the non-zero coefficients uh, randomly. Now, if these two assumptions are satisfied, then this is the statement, then the causal coefficient is indeed uh, one that uh, minimizes um, the L0 norm in this solution space calligraphic B. So if you like, this is out of all potential uh, causal coefficients. This is, um, if you look at the sparsest solutions, then the beta star is at least one of them. Uh, so this is, if you like, uh, similar to this one implication sign that I, I showed earlier. So now the question is, well, when is this unique? I'm going to, to show this in a, in a second. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, give an example where this second assumption is set uh, is violated. Um, so to hopefully understand a bit better what's going on here. Uh, so this is an example where we have two instruments and we have uh, three covariates. Uh, and what you see here is that um, we have a weird matching of coefficients, in particular the two here 
is exactly the same from x2 to y and x2 to x3. And the one is the same on these two edges here. And what is happening now is that um, this is a sort of, if you like, this is a bad example. So this messes up identifiability. And why is this? Because um, you are trying, similar as in the classical IV setup, you're trying to shield off the instruments from the response. So you're somehow trying to uh, find the coefficient vector beta such that the residuals are not uh, uh, correlated with the instruments anymore. And here the problem uh, is that the full effect from the instruments that enters y, um, so this is a, if you like, it's four times the first instrument uh, plus six times the second instrument. This is exactly encoded in this x3. So this is why uh, here you actually find a sparser solution than the causal one, namely if you just use X3, because it sort of, uh, it copies the whole heterogeneity that goes through the system uh, in, a, in a single node. So this is a bad example. This is what we are excluding by A2. And here you could argue, well, this can only happen uh, if you have this, this funny matchup of, of coefficients. Okay, so now, what is the last coefficient that gives us a uniqueness? Uh, uh, let's to try to read this uh, together. So first of all, well, if this A3 holds, then we indeed have that the causal coefficients are the unique solution. So what is this condition? It basically says that uh, you should not be able to sort of replace the parents by some other set. So for all subsets to one, of one to G that have the same cardinality as the parents, um, we should not be able to sort of uh, um, uh, replace the parents uh, in the following sense. So the image of the submatrix uh, should not be the same as the uh, image of the uh, submatrix when using the parents of Y. And, it, and again, this is a bit of a similar uh, uh, reasoning as, as before. So uh, if you can just copy the, the whole heterogeneity in some other set, then of course you can use this as the, the parents as well. Now, these are very technical conditions. Um, we actually uh, um, believe that they are at least very close to uh, um, uh, necessary as well. We didn't uh, prove this, but uh, actually uh, we believe that uh, it's probably can be proven without uh, introducing much, much more than this here. But the question uh, I would also like to touch a bit up on is um, what does this mean graphically? It sounds like there's a question or maybe a yeah, Yes, can I ask comment? a question? So is yeah. that, uh, because I think in the initial case when the number of IV, um, I think the rank condition that you usually have to have point identification in the initial model seems to me that you need to have a kind of at least uh, a number of IV has to be bigger than the number of covariate, right? Yes. So how, how this condition is related to your A3 here? So can I have lower set of IV than the covariate and this condition with how, how this is related to the rank condition that we are talking about? Yeah, it's a good question and we were wondering the same. Uh, and I hope uh, the, the following result gives a bit of insight there. Uh, so indeed this condition can be satisfied if the number of instruments is much, much smaller. Uh, than the number of covariates, but it has to be at least uh, the same size as the number of parents. Uh, but but maybe so maybe the, the the next result gives a bit of insight, and if not, then uh, please uh, re ask the, the question later. So we were wondering the same. Yeah. So what does this mean graphically? So here again, I'm uh, <laughs> I, I'm showing the result, and I hope that uh, it doesn't come as a big surprise. So. What we need to do is, as I said earlier, we need to have enough heterogeneity that enters uh, at the parents of Y. Uh, and one of the graphical conditions to, to satisfy this is that there must be at least the number of parents of Y disjoint directed paths, not sharing any nodes. This is what I mean by uh, disjoint directed paths from the instruments to the parents of I. You're going to see an example in a second. Then this random coefficients, this is a bit simplified now, but uh, uh, basically this is uh, um, avoiding this match up of the, of the coefficients that I talked earlier. And then there's a third condition. Um, what does this look like? This is a bit more technical, but basically this is saying that 
Um, so you need to make sure that you cannot uh, sort of replace the parents by another set of the same cardinality. Uh, and here, uh, this, this uh, assumption is ensuring this, we can just read it. It's not as important as B1. So if this is now a bit confusing, then this doesn't, doesn't matter. But just for completeness, so, so what does it say? It says that for all subsets of the same cardinality as the parents, um, we need to have at least one of the following conditions that is satisfied. So one, uh, it can be that the sort of the instruments that are ancestors of the set, th these are different from the parents. So this just means that there's different heterogeneity in the set. So then all is fine. The set will not work as a uh, sort of a replacement for the parents. Um, but even if this is satisfied, um, I need to make sure that there's sort of enough uh, heterogeneity in this other set as well. Um, and then I sort of all is fine as well. And this is what the second uh, condition here is, is, is saying. So maybe it's more instructive to look at, uh, at some examples. So this is the graph that I have shown before. So uh, we can now ask, well, um, if this is the linear system, of course, we don't know. But if this would be the linear system, would uh, the causal effect then be identifiable? Uh, and indeed, the answer here is yes. Why is this, for example? We can check are there enough uh, uh, um, distinct or disjoint uh, directed path and indeed there is so for example we have a path that goes from one to x8 x5 x1 and y this is one path and then we have uh, so this enters at x1 and we have another path that is entirely distinct so we can go from um, the second instrument by x9 x6 to x2 so this is uh, these two paths here that i just uh, named, uh, they are sufficient. So this means indeed uh, there is um, there is enough heterogeneity propagating through the system. And you cannot replace these two uh, variables by anything else because uh, of this last condition here in particular. Uh, what we are going to see is that even though the ancestors are the same, uh, there is so much heterogeneity coming through the system that we cannot replace. Uh, these uh, these x1 and x2, which are the parents of y. So here, indeed, the answer is yes. So this is an identifiable setup. Um, for the next example, of course, uh, you already guess it. The answer here is no. So this is not an identifiable uh, setup. And why is this? Uh, you can maybe just look at this for a couple of seconds, and then you probably find the reason yourself. So why is this not an identifiable setup? So here the problem is that even, even though I have a, what looks like enough instruments, uh, so I have four instruments and I have four parents, uh, somehow this uh, we have this bottleneck in between. <laughs> so there are three edges. So I have a four dimensional, if you like, a, a, a full covariance matrix of the, y, uh, of the i. So this is four dimensions, but the problem is they have to go through this bottleneck of uh, three edges and this means that I don't have enough heterogeneity entering the parents of y. So here the answer is no. Um, so I I mean, I, of course, you can now do the uh, sort of do a, a consistent uh, method for this and uh, do simulations and so on. The, we have done this. Um, I'll, I'll show the, the link to the paper in a second. Um, instead, maybe I, I would like, just like to mention this is, um, in fact, we didn't uh, start with this question directly, but this is really motivated um, by um, a joint project together with uh, uh, Stephen Hill and uh, Sash Mugaji. Uh, this is a biological, biological application um, uh, that unfortunately I don't have time to talk about uh, today, but if you're interested, I'm of course more than happy to, uh, to say a bit more about this and uh, we are also currently working uh, working on it. It's uh, quite an interesting work, I think, uh, where indeed you have, and you can already mention, so if, if you have a genetic um, network, for example, you have a bit of heterogeneity and certainly not uh, as many instruments as you have uh, uh, covariates. Uh, and here the question is, well, can you still do something under a sparsity assumption? Okay, so if uh, oh, this is uh, what's written on, on the slide here, uh, so I just um, maybe want to mention one more aspect on IV and in some sense uh, it's uh, similar here. So this is also something that we stumbled upon when looking at an application when uh, estimating 
uh, price elasticities uh, and this is uh, i will uh, be short on this i just thought uh, to share this because maybe someone else uh, stumbled upon the same problem and uh, so then uh, people don't have to solve it twice uh, this is a, a setup where we have an iv but we have a time series structure uh, in particular you can think about a var process a vector autoregressive process and the question is, can we actually do IV there? And of course, the answer is yes. Uh, the question is just how exactly do we do it? Um, so here you see a VAR process uh, and we have the instrumental process uh, on top. Um, and then we have a covariate, this is X. So time goes from left to the right. Um, then we have our response Y and we have these hidden variables uh, H that we don't observe. And now the, the naive implementation of uh, um, of instruments and of course no one would do this but it's maybe to say well um, we are looking at the um, yt minus beta star xt minus one so we're interested in the causal effect from xt minus one to yt um, and the question is well can we just now look at the covariance between this uh, term and it minus two so this is the yellow path here if you like and the answer is of course no we cannot do this so this uh, covariance uh, here will be in general non-zero and the reason is the red path this is a confounding path so this is an intuitive explanation so even if you have the correct beta star this covariance doesn't vanish because you have this confounding path that is the red path now how how do you solve this uh, I don't show you the all the formula I just uh, wanted to share the idea and uh, some of you may guess this already there's a bit of a twist this is why i'm i'm mentioning this so you can do something like uh, conditional instrumental variables um uh, which i explain in a, in a second uh, but you can also do something else and this is what i wanted to share so what you see here is now um this is without the time structure this is again an iv setup where we have this additional covariate b uh, and this of course messes up the traditional iv uh, the naive IV estimator in a similar way uh, as it failed on the previous slide. Uh, but here you can just say, well, if you now condition on B, then everything is fine. Uh, so here B, if I condition on B, then this is really a IV setup uh, like from the textbook. So we can still uh, use it. This is often called conditional IV. Uh, and I don't write down the, the precise uh, definition here, but this is a uh, work by um, uh, Brito and Pearl and uh, maybe others. Uh, Leonard Tenkel uh, also has a nice, I think, a nice uh, uh, characterization in his PhD thesis. Uh, now this is in the middle, and this is what I would like to share. In the middle, there's a setup that is a bit similar, um, but now there's just one edge reversed, so we call this Z now. And if you look at this, then if you are interested in the causal effect from then of course that you're opening new parts here so you cannot just condition on on, uh, on z but you can do something that is uh, sounds a bit uh, trivial but that helps here uh, you can just use what we would like to call nuisance iv and again i'm happy for this i wouldn't be surprised to say that we are now considering x and z at the same time and even though we are only interested in the causal effect from x to y uh, we are uh, putting z into the picture as well and we are estimating the causal effect from x and z to y so this is why we are adding a nuisance variable um, uh, this is identifiable in this case and then we are just marginalizing and looking at the causal effect just from x to y in some sense this is a trivial idea uh, but funnily enough uh, this helps in some situations where conditional IV doesn't help. Uh, and here on the right, just for completeness, there are scenarios um, where you can have uh, either you can use conditional IV or what we call nuisance IV. The question is now, well, is one strictly better than the other? Uh, and uh, the answer is uh, no, not in general. So if you look at asymptotic variances, for example, there's no strict ordering here. Okay, so and this this is what you can also apply in these uh, in this VAR uh, setup. So you can come up with uh, there's a general technique uh, using this conditional IV and the NIV to come up with these moment equations uh, that you can then solve. 
so this is uh, not surprising, but this is what we needed for this uh, for this project. Uh, so I just uh, thought that I shared with you. Also, what you need to do in between, by the way, is uh, proving the uh, Markov condition for these uh, VAR processes, uh, uh, which are um, uh, just a bit technical because these are infinitely large graphs, uh, but uh, one can use uh, uh, sort of ideas that are a bit similar to these, uh, to this proof by Stefan Lauritsen and uh, colleagues uh, about the equivalence of uh, Markov conditions uh, in the case where there are no uh, densities. Okay, so this is what I wanted to share about this. So this is one of these uh, nuisance IV moment equations. The details don't matter. It's just saying that uh, it, it works and you can do this in, in these graph setups. There's also a um, condition for the unique identifiability. Uh, it's actually quite beautiful, I think, in terms of mathematics. You use the uh, Jordan normal form, something that uh, at least I haven't used for many years after leaving uh, university. Uh, but this is what pops up here. Uh, for uh, proving unique identifiability, but the details are in, on this paper. Um, according to my clock, uh, I only have a couple of minutes uh, left, but I, I think that's fine. I just share maybe one last uh, thought. Um, and I'm curious, I mean, if people are willing to, to share their opinion, I'm, I would be happy to hear. Um, so we have been now also in the last couple of years looking uh, quite a bit of course, also into this econometrics literature, which is uh, very rich, of course, <laughs> a lot of things have been done. Um, and this is maybe a, a personal viewpoint. We, we thought that, or we found that, uh, and that the under-identified cases, so the cases where uh, we don't have this unique identifiability, this is um, something that is maybe not studied a whole lot. Um, and there are, of course, good reasons for this, because maybe you are just interested in the in the causal parameter. But this is still something that uh, we personally find of interest. And the, the reason is that if you are looking at this um, at this space again of, of solutions, um, so and if let's say in the unidentified case, you have um, that the space has a non-trivial dimension, so uh, maybe one or larger. Then, of course, you can add further constraints, as I proposed in the first, ta uh, um, first part of the talks, for example, sparsity. But you can also be wondering, well, are there interesting solutions in this space here? Um, and so we believe <laughs> that there are. And something that we have done now in a, in a couple of different aspects is to always look in the solution space and choose sort of among all these invariant models, among all the ones that are potential causal models, uh, look at the one that is most predictive. And um, I'm not saying that we fully understand uh, what this is doing, but I'm just uh, trying to argue now a bit. So one can, of course, now say, well, maybe this corresponds to the one uh, that uh, has the least confounding in some sense. So there are some trivial statements that one can prove there. But they might also be interesting from a, a distribution generalization point of view, and namely that, uh, well, if you look at these solutions, then they they satisfy uh, a mini max guarantee, namely that uh, if you then look at so sort of you have your training data, uh, if you like, um, and then you look at this uh, most predictive invariant solution. Then this solution satisfies a minimax criteria, namely it is the best predictor um, uh, under the worst case intervention on the instruments. This is a, sort of a, a guarantee. So uh, the hope is that this may help for distribution generalization uh, because these are sort of both stable and predictive solutions. Uh, this is the guarantee. Um, maybe. Uh, someone, if uh, if someone is interested, uh, can just pause the video here. I'm just saying there's an optimality guarantee, and this is a, a very simple argument for the linear IV setup. And and we have been looking at this from uh, sort of very uh, different uh, different angles. Um, and I'm not going into details here, but the the same reasoning sort of you can apply in uh, learning chemical reaction networks. This is what we have done. So again, always with the idea that. Well, in many of these applications, you have a bit of heterogeneity, but certainly not enough uh, to identify a causal effect. So uh, usually the dimension is much smaller than the number of covariates. 
uh, but how can we still use this? And the idea is to say, well, we, we use these few instruments to constrain the space and then look at the most predictive one. And of course, the, I'm aware this is a bit hand wavy, but it actually worked in a couple of applications that we looked at. So this is a chemical reaction network example. We also looked at this uh, in reinforcement learning recently. You can do similar things there uh, and in, in, in earth system science. But this is uh, just, a, if you like, a, a, uh, maybe a thought-provoking um, uh, comment uh, here to conclude my talk. Okay, so what did I talk about? Um, uh, I talked about instrumental variables in these sparse models. Uh, so the identifiability, uh, you, one can just uh, sort of compute uh, the conditions is what I uh, presented there. Uh, and as well in uh, dynamical models, yeah, I didn't uh, have time today at least to talk about the motivating examples here. And then the last bit, this is really just a proposal. I didn't talk much about this, but to say that maybe these underidentified cases, this is at least something we are personally interested in. Uh, and the proposal is to say among all these invariant models, choose the best predictive one. Uh, this often minimizes these worst case uh, prediction errors. So worst case um, in terms of worst case intervention on the instruments, let's say. Okay, so this is uh, all what I wanted to talk about. Uh, the, the time is up uh, and I'm more than happy to uh, try to answer any questions in case there are some. So just one reference, uh, as you said, it econometrics literature is gigantic and uh, Maybe Ismail knows more references, uh, but the um, Lima, Ed Lima, in his uh, specification searches book, he does consider a little bit uh, different specifications and sort of IV versus forward regression versus backward regression and taking reciprocal and then trying to work out. And he does have some papers where he considered that under identified case. Uh, yes. So, okay. Thanks a lot for that. I would be, uh, actually, I'm not sure. I. Uh... <laughs> I uh, know this particular reference, so I would be more than happy to, if you can put it in the chat, for example. Um, and I should clarify, of course, people are studying the unidentified case. Uh, this is, uh, there's <laughs> uh, lots of papers on this. Um, uh, this was just a comment maybe saying that uh, we feel it's it's a bit maybe underexplored, so not to the extent that uh, people are studying the identified or the over-identified case. This was uh, only our impression, but of course it's not the case that no one looks at the unidentified. It's just that uh, we felt there's there may be a, a bit more uh, things one can say about these uh, situations. I, I think and it's right. I was going to say, I think it is right that the under-identified case is less studied, uh, and I think to some extent, it's that when people start to think about things non-parametrically that they started doing it. So I think that looking at things that are under-identified in a parametric setting, people typically will just say, you know, oh, I'll try and find another instrument and then, <laughs> then assume it is identified. But I don't know, this may or may take a different view. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Thomas. I, I was kind of curious about your, your results about point identification in the case when you have less IV that the covariate and then the condition that you put. But because your, your equation is linear, I was wondering, I assume that I have like um, a lower, I have two covariate and one, uh, one IV. And in that case, because it is linear, I can just construct some IV in the different way. I can put Z and say that Z squared times X and construct this as a potential kind of IV and then try to inflate a little bit my model and try to get back to this rank condition and get point identification. Can I, how this method is related to the condition that you, you are? Yeah, so, so maybe I can uh, follow up a bit on this. So of course we need the sparsity, right? So this is a bit of the de degenerate example if you have one instrument and two covariates, but just to make clear, clear, right? So there, it can only ever work if uh, the true causal coefficient has one zero component, right? Because if you, only, if you have one instrument and we have two causal parents, then uh, this identifiability assumptions never hold that are presented. So you need as, as, as many, at least as many instruments as you have sort of non-zeros in your causal uh, coefficient. And then in principle, I mean, there are scenarios where these 
it, assumptions are uh, satisfied, um, even in, in this uh, setup that uh, you described. Um, I should also maybe say the idea is really that you have uh, sort of the heterogeneity entering the system. So we are more thing. I mean, I could imagine the, I've not worked this out, but I could imagine that these uh, conditions are a bit funny in this case of one instrument and uh, two covariates, um, because probably. I think it, it would give a good intuition and a good flavor to see a little bit. I am curious to see. Yeah, but mm -hmm, but but uh, so maybe if I can just add, so if you think about this scenario here, right, uh, a scenario like this. So here, this is a typical identified scenario where you have sort of you have at least two instruments going to the um, to the parents, and then for example, if you have one additional instrument then that propagates through the system, then this is usually sufficient to identify, um, to, to satisfy these identifiability assumptions. And the reason is that you cannot replace these two parents by something else. But uh, you're right, uh, we, we of course uh, sh should work this, uh, these assumptions uh, through in the, in, the, in the simple case that you described, it, it was probably instructive, yeah. But this is at least not the setting that we had in mind uh, for our applications there. Yeah. Right. And if I may add one thing, uh, so the linearity, it's a bit funny because, of course, this is, uh, seems like a strong assumption, and it is, it's just something that we could analyze. Uh, our intuition, so Niklas and my intuition is um, that uh, this really becomes, uh, um, in a way, um, the assumptions become weaker in the nonlinear case. Uh, but we, we uh, haven't looked into this, and uh, I don't actually know how hard this would be to prove even. Um, but the intuition is that, so it's really that if, if these assumptions don't hold, then this is because you can somehow copy this heterogeneity of the instruments in, in some other covariates, let's say in, in three and four. It's not the case in this graph, but in, uh, this would be a, a failure of identifiability if the, you have the same sort of instrument influence in these two, two variables. And we believe this is much much less likely to happen if you have uh, non-linearities because then they uh, all these heterogeneities get uh, sort of uh, strummed up but this is something uh, that uh, we this is completely only a guess uh, so this is our intuition and we don't have any results on this yeah. okay i i think let thanks uh Jonas for the wonderful talk Yeah, thanks again and enjoy the rest of the workshop. I, I will, I know I will.